We've made enormous progress in terms of um, fighting HIV. Uh, fewer people are dying, so thanks to treatment, and fewer people are becoming infected. Although um, there's still what six, seven hundred thousand people dying from, uh, you know, from HIV infection, and uh, what 1.67 million mm -hmm. becoming infected. So the epidemic is not over by any means, but there is a huge um, risk of complacency, and I see it already. Um, I see it already also in the fact that there is less money for uh, dealing with AIDS. Um, and, uh, you know, there is a lot of, uh, you know, also high risk behavior that uh, we see in many populations and because people are no longer dying, thanks exactly to, mm -hmm. to treatment. And also politically, uh, AIDS is no longer on the uh, top agenda, uh, political agenda, economic agenda, where it was before. And I think that's an extremely dangerous situation um, because I know what will happen. What will happen is that more people will become infected and more people will die. So it's really important to kind of reset the response to AIDS and have a better balance between, um, you know, offering treatment for all those in need. And that mm -hmm. still is not where we should be. We still have to uh, go further, but also to uh, emphasize much more and invest much more in uh, prevention. Well, theoretically, and also demonstrated in um, well-documented clinical studies, indeed, if you have viral suppression thanks to antiretroviral um, therapy, then you're not infectious. And, uh, and, and that's, there's no doubt about that. Um, however, there's a big difference between um, clinical studies um, in, in very well-defined populations and real life. Um, and that can go from the fact that uh, people can't take their uh, treatment all the time. There are, uh, you know, um, supply issues. Uh, we know that, that uh, treatment interruption is there or for other reasons that, you know, it's, it's really mm -hmm. daily life. I mean, I take statins and now and then I forget it, but that's okay. You know, Absolutely, there's no, yeah. not so much of a problem. It could be a problem with HIV. There is also um, growing resistance to antiretroviral uh, therapy, to the, to the drugs. Fortunately, uh, pharmaceutical industry comes up with uh, new drugs. So that's, uh, you know, it's a race between resistance development of a virus that's extre extremely smart and new drugs. Um, and uh, we are not perfect uh, human beings. We're not robots. Um, so we have to be very realistic. We can do better. We can have more people on treatment and with better compli uh, compliance and all that. But um, we also need to make sure that people are in the first place are not getting infected. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and that's where old-fashioned things like condoms are still yeah. really very and relevant. Nobody talks about condoms, but right? But where is the, uh, you don't hear anything about yeah. condoms anymore. Um, there's of course PrEP, but <coughs> when you look at the world, um, and, and I'm think looking at Africa, for example, there's only one country that is really doing reasonably well in terms of PrEP, and that's Kenya. Other countries, it's not there, it's too expensive, uh, it's not part of the national programs. And there are many other uh, things that we can do um, that are not doing, being done also because the, um, you know, the investments are not there, because these things cost money. Pre-exposure prophylaxis um, is quite popular here in London. Uh -huh. And uh, thanks to that, we have seen a, quite a, a decrease, decrease in, yeah. in a number of new infections. Mm. But again, you have to think about it and uh, <laughs> to, to take of it course. and it has to be available. I think for the first time, I'm quite confident that we will have a vaccine that's at least partially uh, effective. Um, there are trials going on, mm -hmm. uh, both in uh, you know, heterosexual populations and in populations of gay men. And um, the uh, results from, particularly from animal studies and also uh, you know, the uh, immune response that we see um, make me far more optimistic than ever before. However, that's going to take several years Absolutely. if we are lucky to bring that to the market. 
In terms of cure, I'm probably less uh, optimistic uh, in the sense that we have a few people, a couple of people literally, who have been completely cleared of uh, HIV virus. And I think theoretically it's definitely possible to do it. We, we, we've seen, we have the proof, but it's very complicated, extremely expensive. So if we find a cure for the time being, I don't see a cure that is going to be widely available. But what uh, the good news is that we're uh, having now new developments in drugs, drugs that can be, you know, long acting, that you don't have yeah. to take yeah. every day. Um, so I'm sure there will be major, uh, you know, um, improvements, but maybe, um, you know, treating HIV becomes something like living with diabetes, you take also your pills or, or with hypertension and so on. So, uh, you know, the drugs will become ever better, uh, easier for the patient to take, less side effects. So yeah. when you compare what we have today to uh, at the early stages of uh, antiretroviral therapy, you know, starting in 1996, um, we've come a long way. It's very clear that we will not reach the uh, UN and UNAIDS uh, objectives of uh, 500,000 uh, people newly infected with HIV by the end of 2020, uh, because now we are at like 1.6 million, 1.7 million. And I can't imagine that in one year we would see a drop by over a million. So I think we have to be realistic. Um, there is progress, but it's slow. And also there are parts of the world where we actually see an increase in new infections, such as the countries of the former Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. There's an increase. Um, and uh, the decrease is not as spectacular as we would have all hoped. Um, so that's a, a problem. Now, where we've made good progress is actually on so-called 1990-90. Um, but we should also um, realize what that means. 90% of 90% of 90% is 73 percent so in other words of those of people living with hiv um, you know the goal is then to have 73 percent with viral suppression yeah and that means that there are 27 percent who are not viral suppressed and who can continue to transmit um, so that is uh, uh, the way to to look at also um, that it's often the people who are the most marginalized, the hardest to reach for whatever reason, because it could be because homosexuality is illegal in the country yeah. or there is a very repressive um, you know, policy uh, against drug or users. A high level of stigma. Stigma well. is a very big driver of non-access to treatment and hence also to continuing uh, transmission. So all this has to be addressed. Uh, it's possible to address it but we see a decline in funding for HIV and that has to be reversed. Without, we shouldn't fool ourselves. Um, the um, problem of AIDS is so huge um, the, um, the way to end it will require billions and, um, and it will require billions for many years to come. And if there is a drop in funding or if it's not going up to where it's needed, um, we will see more infections, more deaths. And um, it's not rocket science, that's the way it is. The hence that it's so important to make sure that AIDS remains on the political agenda, that the money is available and that we also combat stigma as much as we can mm -hmm. because that drives AIDS underground. When antiretroviral therapy uh, became widely accessible, I had the hope that uh, stigma and discrimination would disappear, that this would become like normalized to say so, because it's a treatable condition. Um, 
but that unfortunately has not happened. I think in many societies that uh, there is far more acceptance of uh, uh, you know people living with HIV, but not everywhere. And there's still a lot of hidden suffering um, and discrimination. And uh, and I think that that's probably because it's often about something else. It's moral judgment. Uh, people did not behave uh, as the. Uh, the official morally not morals, accepted morally not accepted and um, you know that's one aspect a lot has to do with uh, attitudes to uh, uh, sexuality particularly homosexuality in many uh, cultures and sex workers um, probably as well sex work um, and so on so uh, I think we uh, we must really proactively deal with the stigma and discrimination and not hope that it will go away spontaneously yeah. And on the discrimination side, um, you know, there are legal frameworks because discrimination is, you know, how you're treated in society, in the workplace, uh -huh. uh, even in the healthcare setting. There was a lot of discrimination uh, in the early days, today probably much less. Um, some of it was based on fear. I can get it also if I treat someone living with HIV, that was certainly played a role, but today that's not, a, uh, you know, I know no reasonable person. Uh, should be afraid of, of getting HIV just by touching yeah. someone. Um, but stigma is in our head. That's very different. Stigma is... You and there's know, a also we, a lot of internalized stigma. The stigma is on the one hand for others, uh, you know, um, be it because people are different, we cannot accept, and then we're all our moral judgments mm -hmm. are there. But it's also self-stigma. And, uh, you know, and uh, uh, dealing with lack of self-esteem, but also um, guilt feelings with stigma and so on. So it is a very complex uh, phenomenon and I'm not a social scientist or a psychologist to understand, but I know that if we don't deal with it, then um, we make things worse. Absolutely. And uh, we will not solve uh, and, and end this uh, epidemic. Yeah, I always uh, think that I should have gone the political way much faster. Uh, when I started with UNAIDS, I was more of an academic and uh, I thought if people know, if we have the evidence, the rest will follow. And that was naive. And uh, um, so I, I, and I'm, I was often upset how many institutions, many individuals did not take up their responsibility and uh, were more interested by their institutional entrenchments uh, rather than saving lives. And uh, uh, I'm not sure whether I would have succeeded, but I always feel that I fell short and I could have done more. Mm. Well, I feel that you're a very humble person, Peter, and I believe that true greatness is born in the realm of humility. And I think a lot of people could learn a great deal from you. And I would like to thank you as an HIV positive person for everything you've done for the HIV and AIDS community in the world and especially uh, your exceptional leadership when the world needed it the most. So thank you very much and thank you very much for joining us on the podcast. It's been an thank honor. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll continue. Eh? Uh, and don't give up. Okay. Thank you so much, thank Peter. You. All right. <laughs>